welcome everyone. Uh, this is the session. Uh, this is the session from uh, uh, Israel. This session is co-sponsored by Tel Aviv University and uh, by the IDC. Um, just a second. Okay. So um, we decided uh, before we start. I want to thank uh, the ECGI and especially Elaine and Vanessa. I also want to thank uh, Luca and Rike from Oxford for putting this event together. We decided to focus our session on two different aspects that arise out of this crisis. The first aspect is uh, startups and scale-ups and government. And this is perhaps the more optimistic one. The second aspect is uh, director's duties in times of crisis. I will be moderating the first panel and Amir Licht will moderate uh, the second panel. Um, and we're going to start now with the first panel. Uh, we know that this crisis, especially at this stage, is particularly difficult for, it's particularly difficult for companies uh, that are small or relatively smaller. And the questions that uh, many countries, and especially countries like uh, Israel, that has a relatively developed uh, startup ecosystem, are, are startups any different from any other uh, small company? Uh, do we need, for this type of companies, uh, any special form of government intervention? Uh, are there any differences across countries? And are there any differences between early and growth stage and companies. We'll start with Eugene Kendall from uh, Hebrew University Startup Nation Central and the ECGI. Uh, we'll then have uh, Georg talk about uh, what's going on in Germany. And uh, we'll turn to Stephen Solomon from Berkeley will talk a little bit about Silicon Valley and the US, and we'll conclude our first uh, round of speakers with Karen Nevo from the Growth Companies Forum uh, in Israel. Uh, each speaker will talk for uh, up to eight minutes, and then we hope to have a discussion. Uh, to all, all the speakers, uh, all for speakers, uh, all the participants who are not panelists and want to ask questions, please uh, use the Q&A uh, function and we'll try to get you speaking. So good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, depending on where you are. Um, how do you see this in the presentation mode? Now it's in the presentation mode. Okay, good. Uh, no, but it, you see two slides, right? Yeah. Ah, okay. So now it's better. All right. Uh, so um, it's my pleasure to to be here. It, it's um, I, I want to talk about uh, a little bit of the impact of this uh, uh, for Israeli innovation ecosystem. Uh, just a few facts that you probably want to know is that uh, in Israel, um, this, uh, this ecosystem is uh, in percentage of the economy is the largest in the world. It's a huge driver for Israeli economy. And so for, for Israeli government, it's, it's definitely a, a challenge of how not to lose this, uh, this uh, sort of wonder that got created here almost by accident over the last 30 years uh, in, in this crisis. Uh, there is a issue that always uh, raised in crisis of why should be bailing out uh, all kinds of uh, wealthy institutions, uh, and the usual argument is that it destroys the incentives for the future. In this case, this argument is not is not applicable because, as everybody understands, this was not planned. It's not man-made, and it's basically uh, not going to change because nobody expects this thing to come back. Um, well, not after it's gone, I mean. So um, a couple of things that, that from the world uh, that, that are very strongly affecting um, Israel, uh, and in fact, uh, there are two. 
Uh, one is there is probably going to be much higher localization and maybe even protectionism, which is not good news for Israeli or other export-oriented economies. But there was also, on the other hand, also going to be dramatic changes in the way we work uh, and can travel, consume healthcare, leisure, entertainment, etc. And so that presents a lot of opportunities for innovators in areas like AI, cyber, digital health, edutech, and others. So that actually makes Israeli tech more valuable in the day after. The another, uh, another part which actually is co correlated with the localization, uh, the localization of supply chains, moving them back to their sort of uh, home countries uh, is going to increase costs and therefore there's going to be much higher demand for um, pro pro um, productivity enhancing measures. So the value at the end uh, is going to increase. But at the same time, tech, Israeli tech has been uh, growing tremendously in the last few years. $8.5 billion investments in venture capital, which on per capita basis is about almost three times higher than the next highest in the world. Uh, but 85% of it was from the foreign funds. And due to this crisis, they basically withdrew from Israel and it's high, uh, widely expected to last for about a year. So that creates a very, very strong liquidity crunch. We also see between 220 to 100 percent loss of revenues. Some companies actually gain revenues, but those are my, minority. Um, some companies just completely lost all their revenues and will any, anybody related to transportation or travel or hospitality. Uh, so they will they will stay like that for a while. So the local investors basically uh, stuck with the uh, given amount of money that they thought would, in, would be enough for them to sustain their portfolios. Then they find themselves that they need to sustain their portfolios for much longer time. And therefore what they're doing is stopping all new investments, unless these are really new funds. Um, and they're culling portfolio companies that they actually wanted to keep and forcing cost cutting in the rest. So all of that means layoffs uh, and layoffs mean um, a lot of loss of knowledge and uh, and actually making these companies much less prepared for competition in the um, in the day after uh, if a company has a short runway and it's not going to get the immediate in, infusion of capital which is not likely unless its uh, investors decide that it's a very promising company uh, they are not going to survive which uh, has, uh, which could be, if the government doesn't intervene, could be up to 30, 40% of younger companies, which is not a good news for an ecosystem that is driving the economy because basically all the deal flow is gonna be gone. And the last thing is that helping this sector is not politically popular. I'm now engaged in a sort of a fight with a, with a newspaper and another person uh, over the uh, logic of whether helping the rich uh, VC funds and the rich uh, uh, people after they exit uh, in, the, in this industry to be bailed out. And the whole idea is that we shouldn't be bailing them out because we want to help them, but because this is something very important for the economy. Um, the proposed government intervention is actually going to generate enormous returns for the government for the very simple reason that unlike in the past and unlike in most other industries, the majority of it is done through matching or partnering with private investors. And private investors, uh, given their limited funds, are not going to invest in companies that have um, low probability of high returns and therefore to some extent or to a large extent, this solves the adverse selection problem that usually associated with government investing, at least in the short run. This is what makes these companies unique in, uh, in the general economy, because in the general economy, there is no new capital that is unattached and is asking uh, tough questions of, of whether to invest or not, and the government can co-invest. So in small companies, basically, the government is introducing runway increasing grants. They're using the existing infrastructure of the Innovation Authority, which always makes grants, but now they, instead of taking three months, they're going to take three weeks. 
and they're going to basically looking whether this company can survive in the next year and a half when making the grant, rather than just looking at the uh, innovation capacity of, of the technology. For the large firms, there's the various types of loans with downside protection. I think Karam is in better position to talk about this. The interesting part is the medium-sized firms where uh, we've been arguing, and I think the government is going in that direction, that the best way to do it is to actually incentivize the um, uh, institutional investors to, uh, to, to utilize this uh, unique opportunity when the valuations are much lower and the value is higher to, to get into this industry. Israeli institutions have been very, very much absent from this uh, sector, and this is high time for them to get in. Uh, what, what happens is that they are allowed to invest uh, in debt and equity instruments uh, along, but there is a demand that they will be doing so along with the new money from venture investors so that the adverse selection is alleviated. And given that the government is going to gain incredible amounts uh, just by, say, by getting all the um, taxes from, from the, these investments and uh, saving on uh, uh, unemployment insurance, uh, the government has plenty of resources uh, embedded in this to uh, downside protect uh, uh, these investments. Uh, the last thing I wanted to, um, the, to say is that there are additional opportunities for the government is to retrain people to modernize government by introducing much more tech and also by designing technology-driven comprehensive solutions for dealing with epidemics in the future because we've been caught, uh, everybody been caught sort of improvising along the way and this is not, uh, this is not the right way to deal with it. One last uh, point that I wanted to, to give you as information, um, Startup Nation Central has been collecting a lot of data uh, on, com on Israeli companies that are relevant for, um, for dealing with corona, uh, both with all kinds of aspects of corona from cybersecurity to remote monitoring to protection to diagnostics and treatments. So in that link, I will share that uh, uh, this presentation. So in this link, you can find all of these. There are over 150 companies. And we also launched Corona Tech Site, which aggregates a lot of relevant information for governments, for, uh, for startups, et cetera, around uh, Corona, mostly focused on Israel, but there is a worldwide information as well. So if anybody is interested, I'd be happy to assist in that. Thank you. Thank you, Eugene. Uh, we'll, you know, I must admit that academics usually promote their research. I was impressed by how you now you become the CEO of a non-for-profit, you promote the non-for-profit. And we now turn the stage to Georg, who will talk about the German model for uh, government assistance. To I hope profit. that we promote what's relevant. <laughs> Georg, please. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's great to be here and to contribute to this debate. Um, I will talk a little bit about startup and startup support in Germany. And there is actually a very interesting and similar debate uh, going on in Germany, whether this a special uh, startup support program is worth doing and what the exact design should be. Uh, just to uh, give you a little bit of the background, the debate has been going along two lines. There are the big supporters for helping startups. Uh, the starting point is obviously that most of the existing support programs that we've set up in Germany uh, only really target large corporations. And um, uh, that's understandable because that's where the most policy focus is on where government programs can make the largest, largest difference. But at the same time, uh, there have been surveys that up to 80% of the startups in Germany are threatened in their existence. This is a survey done by the uh, Association of German Startups. Uh, so maybe a little bit biased, but I think uh, everybody gets the general point. And it's clear that startups are weak and are vulnerable in this situation because 
they don't have large reserves. They don't have a lot of expertise in handling this. They may also have a weaker lobbying power in convincing the government that something needs to be done. But most importantly, they are not bankable in the sense that they are frequently highly risky. This is why they are startups and not existing successful companies. And they are typically not profitable or not yet profitable. Uh, so they would normally obtain a credit from a normal uh, bank to support them. So who does support them normally are VCs, as we've just heard from Eugene. Uh, VCs are generally reluctant to commit to any future funding rounds at the moment. Uh, and uh, an additional uh, issue in Germany is that we do have a vibrant startup community, but we don't have a large venture capital community. So they are frequently located abroad and they are then taking care a lot of their own markets and not uh, willing to support uh, startups in Germany. Now, on the other hand, you have the skeptics uh, who say, don't help startups, you know, because it's highly risky. You don't really know which ones to pick. And it's a badly invested money because uh, we all know that up to 90% of the startups uh, go bankrupt anyhow uh, within a couple of years. Uh, then, of course, it's very hard to pick the, the right ones. Uh, why, why don't you, you know, why did you step away from having this power given to, to governments? Because bureaucrats are not good at, at picking the right ones. And there's the risk of political influence on, on which ones to pick. Finally, the one that Eugene has already been mentioning as well is also being raised here. Uh, you, you are risking you know, to pay the millionaires because the argument is you, in reality, you're not supporting the startups, but you are in reality subsidizing the venture capital firms. Uh, and the other problem is you may over include in the sense that you support startups and give money to everybody, to some of them that don't really need your help. Now, most important problem is uh, how to do it. And here the problem is that uh, you don't want to, uh, whatever you do, you don't want to use a loan system. Yeah. Uh, and that has a number of reasons. Firstly, uh, I've already mentioned that many startups are not bankable. Uh, many even don't have a bank, a uh, house bank. So the, the existing government support programs in Germany that we have run through commercial banks. So they're handled through commercial banks and they have been given to their clients. So many startups wouldn't really be able to access any of the existing funding programs. And even if startup has a bank, um, it wouldn't normally fulfill the criteria for obtaining a loan uh, from a commercial bank. So it is not profitable. It doesn't provide good collateral. It, it, it simply falls through all the uh, criteria that are out there. Thirdly, for many of the existing um, uh, loan system, loan programs, it's the balance sheet of 2019 that counts to determine the creditworthiness. But we know that in the startup world, uh, all of this moves extremely fast. So the balance sheet of 2019 may already be outdated. It does not really catch the dynamics of the firm that is uh, ongoing. And final point, uh, if you give out loans to startup, this will create a huge debt burden in the future and may constrain their viability and their freedom, commercial freedom in the future. Also, it will reduce the attractiveness for any future financing rounds when these startups already have a large debt burden that they carry with them. So is this uh, controversy that has been going on in the debate in Germany. And then comes in this uh, man. Uh, I don't know how many of you have a Miele dishwasher or something similar at home. So this, this guy is called Christian Miele. He is the, I don't know, great, great grandson or something of the former, uh, the dynasty of entrepreneurs in Germany. And he's now leading the startup community. Uh, he's the chief lobbyist, if you like, of the startup community in Germany. He's extremely, been extremely successful in convincing the government that they need to do something, but that it should be consistent with the criticism and it should be consistent with a market economy. So what uh, the government has now announced is a specific fund for startups, which comprises 2 billion euros. And importantly, it applies alongside many other measures, right, to, to cut down work short and to get immediate uh, government support, et cetera. But this is a specific fund that's been set up just exclusively for startups. 
and it has three separate pillars. Uh, number one, there is a big pot of funding for future financing rounds. And just like Eugene has been saying, the idea is to go for co-investments that are being made jointly together with private investors. You know, so that uh, avoids the problem that politics has to choose directly uh, which startup is worthy uh, or to select, you know, this is the one that we want to find. And it avoids the problem of giving money directly to the startup. Um, so rather you do it together uh, with, a, with a fund. And secondly, um, KfE Capital and e European Investment Fund, EIF, uh, these are funds of funds, right? So they fund funds, essentially. They have been uh, given additional public money uh, to take over the stakes of some funds that pull out. So this is the risk of uh, some funds in future financing rounds not being uh, uh, fully able of living up to their promises. And third pillar is, to facilitate financing of those startups that do not have VCs. Yeah, so this is a, a set of measures that aim at facilitating VC financing and equity replacement finance. Uh, on the long-term uh, schedule, uh, the government is working on a future fund for startups, which will then be much larger and comprise about 10 million. Just to finish up a few words on the politics, you cannot avoid politics these days. Um, uh, why is this happening? Why was Miele so successful? Of course, he's a good charismatic guy. He's very successful in what he's doing, but there is an, an additional story, I think, in the background. Germany is relatively proud and relatively proud of its startup scene, particularly Berlin is full of startups at the moment. Um, but as I've said, you know, many venture capital firms are uh, abroad, so we don't really have the, the backbone to support this industry uh, locally. Uh, so th this is, in a way, an explanation of why the government is very keen to step in and to somehow support this community. Uh, and there is the other political story, of course, of everybody needs to get something. Uh, the po politicians at the moment trying to uh, uh, satisfy every uh, little constituency. Um, uh, one may argue that a shortcut may be to you know, give helicopter money or to cut rents or whatever uh, to everybody, but maybe psychologically it's easier to give a little pot of money to every little community that there is. That's my uh, two cents on Germany. I very much look forward to the future debate. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Georg. Uh, I think one interesting comparison that uh, uh, one can draw from the two presentations is that relatively smaller countries in terms of the startup scene that want to compete internationally were the first one to act and to support their competitive position. We may get back to that later, but now you know we have today a truly international panel uh, across time zones and, and continents. So I'm very happy to invite uh, Stephen David of Solomon from uh, Berkeley University to talk about uh, the case in the US. Uh, thank you, Asaf. I, I should add, uh, I, I will be teaching at Tel Aviv in December. So I do uh, have some relevance to this panel, at least uh, institutionally. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm really glad to be talking about uh, venture capital because as you know, I'm in the Bay Area. and. Uh, I'm going to just uh, use my uh, six or seven minutes to talk about three things. Uh, the first is valuation and effects, or the first and second is valuation and effects. And the third, I'll talk a bit about the programs that the government is uh, implementing uh, that are not specific to venture capital, but are being used by uh, venture capital companies. I think, uh, uh, first of all, I, I mean, we entered into this uh, very surprisingly a month ago in the United States uh, with valuations already shaky for many venture capital companies. Uh, the, the, the WeWork uh, debacle in the fall had really focused on um, the unicorns and whether they were appropriately valued. There was already a big debate about whether uh, you know, at least a third of these were worth well below a uh, billion dollars, which is what we define as a unicorn here. Um, and uh, SoftBank uh, had um, particular difficulties. And in fact, out here uh, now, uh, there is a stigma if you've taken SoftBank money that, you know, you must be uh, something wrong with you. So we entered into this with valuations already shaky. 
Uh, and um, uh, it, it's, it's hard not to underestimate the carnage that's going through uh, small businesses in the United States right now. Uh, essentially, uh, vast uh, sectors are closed down w without a prospect of reopening. While well, Europe is, is more advanced through the pandemic and uh, beginning to open things up, uh, here uh, for small businesses, uh, the effect is uh, frankly just horrific um, and the entire, entire industries, including restaurants, entertainment, etc., cetera, uh, remain closed and uh, with no uh, viable timeline to reopen. Um, and so uh, with that, uh, the particular effect on venture capital has actually been less impactful in many ways. Uh, and, and I say this for, for, for two reasons. One is, um, you know, these, while the business plans for many of these companies have been upset or revised, for example, Lime, the scooter company, uh, Airbnb, uh, the big uh, uh, um, travel company, um, most of them were capitalized enough that they can last a year or two. Uh, and uh, we still have significant amounts of dry powder uh, in terms of equity investment that can go into these investments. Um, so what you're beginning to see, at least hesitantly, is um, uh, some, some refinancing, uh, some refinancing, uh, and um, um, uh, specifically, we saw Airbnb take on debt and equity at a valuation, basically about half of what they were before, from $30 billion to $18 uh, billion. Uh, and for smaller companies like Lime and otherwise, um, they're going to try and hold out as long as possible so we can, you know, as we begin to start exiting uh, this economically, uh, hopefully they let us out uh, in a month or two or begin to let us out. Uh, uh, you know, we start to hit what, what people hope is a V and, and maybe a, a less uh, sharp, sharp incline. So right now, I, I think the feeling of venture capital is sit tight um, and see what happens. Uh, many venture capital companies out here, um, frankly, have, have been helped by this, uh, you know, cloud companies, uh, Amazon and the, and the big sort of well-capitalized companies. Uh, some of them have, you know, tens of billions of dollars, if not a hundred billion dollars plus if you're Apple sitting on their balance sheets. And the expectation is those companies will come in as valuations stabilize uh, to, to again scoop up companies uh, with the, the, the authorities distracted from an antitrust perspective and, and unwilling to sort of enforce uh, given the, the, the economic situation. Um, so the, the outlook here is, is actually for venture capital, it, it seems to be, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say optimistic, but not, not that pessimistic. Now, the government, um, it, it's hard to underestimate how hard the government has come in for support of the economy up to now, and uh, particularly the Federal Reserve. And so uh, the, there have been no uh, specific programs that have been put out for venture capital. But the main program that venture capital companies are relying on right now, and I'll talk about uh, two, two tranches. One is uh, the, the, the government program that uh, uh, the Congress passed and then the Federal Reserve's activities. The main program that the government put forth with, was the $2 trillion CARES Act. And within that, they had a $350 billion program called the Paycheck Protection Program. And essentially you can get a loan for 2.5 times your monthly payroll that is entirely forgivable. Uh, I think as a technical matter, since we have many, many lawyers on this call, what's most interesting about it is to get the loan, um, there are affiliate provisions and you cannot have more than 500 employees. But if you have an investor that's an affiliate, uh, uh, then they count the employees all across the portfolio companies. And so what venture capital companies have been busy doing is removing um, negative covenants because in the US rules for these loans, if you have the ability to veto uh, decisions, uh, you're considered to be an affiliate. Um, and what uh, is interesting is the venture capital companies have decided, well, we don't really value these anymore. Uh, uh, we'd rather take the money. And so venture capital lawyers have been busy stripping venture capitalists of all their control rights so that they can take this loan. I think the, interesting, the other interesting thing about this loan is that um, many venture capital companies, even though they qualify 
uh, have on moral grounds refused to take it. Uh, we're going to be disclosing the names uh, through uh, you know, the Federal Open Records Act, and they don't uh, want to be seen taking money that they, they might not need. Um, we're not seeing that as much from the financial sector, private equity hedge funds, but we are seeing that in the venture capital sector. Uh, the final thing that we're seeing, which isn't as much help to uh, venture capital, but it's just worth noting is, I, I, I mean, we have learned from our last crises and it's, it's hard to underestimate how strong the Fed has come in. If, 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 if the financial crisis of 2008 is a one, we're at 10 right now. And just in the last week alone, the Fed has announced a $2.3 trillion uh, loan program, uh, of which uh, over about 600 billion will be the Main Street Lending Program, which will give uh, you know, long-term loans to uh, small businesses with up to 10,000 employees. Uh, it is debt, it is not forgivable. Uh, uh, and it, it might be that some venture capital companies will resort to this just to sort of carry them through. I, I doubt that many will, because frankly, there still remains a ton of dry powder here uh, to support these companies. Um, so that's the landscape. Uh, high uncertainty really depends upon uh, how long uh, uh, the economy remains shut down. And um, I have no answer for that. Okay, uh, Stephen, thank you very much. You remind us what's the time uh, in California right now? Uh, it is 12 a.m. Okay, we really appreciate your effort staying up. Our next speaker is uh, Karim Nevo. Karim Nevo is uh, uh, from Israel World Forum. For the sake of disclosure, I must say that I work pro bono as the academic advisor to that forum, and Karim will talk a bit about the forum and a bit about how the crisis looks from the perspectives of companies who were not early stage companies, but companies at the later development stage. Karen, please. Um, okay, so good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Karen Nevo. Uh, I, am, I have two hats in this, uh, in this call. One is I'm head of government relations at Twix.com, uh, which is, I think, the largest Israeli internet company uh, based in Israel, uh, we are a platform for small businesses to create uh, their online uh, uh, presence. And uh, on, the on my second hat, I'm also um, managing the Israeli Growth Forum. Uh, it's a, a, a group of companies who've decided to work together and, um, and create a, some kind of a lobbying group, you, you, you can say. Uh, to represent Israeli growth uh, cluster. These are our members. Um, the forum is around for the past five years. We decided to build uh, the Israeli Growth Forum under uh, our understanding that the Israeli government doesn't really know how to work with big Israeli tech companies. The Israeli government uh, traditionally uh, did a very good job working with startups, with uh, small startups, and with big multinational companies. But having one of those startups becoming a big company was not uh, at the center of attention. And this is why a lot of, you know, the governmental tools and infrastructure was not built for, uh, uh, for these kind of companies, uh, which are a big, you know, financial potential for the Israeli market. Um, so the Growth Forum is representing those companies and their interests and is trying to help the government uh, build this infrastructure. Um, and we've been around, as I said, for the past five years. So if I'll go into the, you know, the specific uh, characteristics of, of this cluster. So we're talking about companies who have hundreds of employees, okay? They're global companies, that mean they don't sell in just one territory, but in multiple ones. And it's important to say that uh, many times, I think most cases, the Israeli market is irrelevant to them. This is, this is very important for this crisis. Uh, they have a turnover of over $50 million uh, and get to much higher you know, amounts. Uh, and they're very much dependent on equity investment over time. And the overtime part is very important because 
um, it took many years to, to build Wix. Uh, it took many, many years to build Tabula, Melanox, and other, you know, uh, growth companies in Israel. Uh, and as Eugene mentioned, if we lose one of those companies, it will take us the same amount of years uh, to build them all over again. This is why this cluster has significant importance to the Israeli market. But as the government sees it, and as we see it, this is uh, uh, one of the best and, and most high quality tax clusters in Israel that will generate, you know, revenues from taxation in the, in the upcoming years. And this is why uh, we think that the, that the Israeli government should pay specific attention to this cluster. Um, so going into the crisis, we have, you know, a few assumptions we wanted to, to uh, uh, prevail to the government. First, that the meaning of full recovery, not like very differently from, from the, the Israeli market as a whole, is when other territories are going into recovery and not when the Israeli one is going into recovery. Because if I am, uh, you know, a large change, chain, sorry, of, of, of uh, um, clothing or home equipment, then when the Israeli, you know, market is, is starting the recovery, I'm good. The tech sector looks differently and uh, we wanted to, them to understand that. The second thing is having them understand that this cluster took a hit in revenues and not only, you know, in revenues from, you know, users or, or customers, but also uh, in their funding. And we heard, I think, uh, in, the, uh, in Germany and in the US, we are hearing that funding is a real issue now, that uh, VCs are holding back investment. Uh, and even if they will invest, they will invest in, in, in lower valuations. Um, we also took a hit uh, in, you know, in, in the expense area because uh, we, are still, uh, we are still paying our employees and employees in, in our kind of, you know, uh, cluster are 60 to 70 percent of, uh, of all expenses. So, so that's a major hit. And also taking into consideration that everybody went to work from home. And while everyone is saying that the high tech sector was dealing, you know, was the best uh, to deal with this kind of situation, uh, kindergartens are closed, schools are closed, and that means that being able to, you know, prevail uh, uh, um, development KPIs have, have been also hit. Um, okay, so what are tech companies doing uh, to address this uh, liquidity crisis? Uh, we see a lot of companies in Israel who are uh, firing or uh, uh, taking their employees to, to a leave of, of, of absence. Uh, we thought that was something the government could have prevented. And if looking at what uh, Stephen said about uh, the US market, I think what the US did was very smart because uh, they made a link between uh, uh, employees retention and, uh, and, and government assistance. We tried to um, talk with the Israeli government to do something similar, I think uh, three weeks ago, but we didn't find much, uh, much of, of, of a partner for that. Um, the second thing we see is valuation reduction uh, possible, and, and, and it's something we, we are starting now to see in new investments in Israel. Um, and you know, the comparison between what's happening in, in the US and other places and Israel uh, is happening all the time. And, and we see that uh, uh, from, com from the competition ex uh, uh, like uh, angle, that the Israeli companies has a lot of disadvantages in the global uh, competition landscape. Um, and I think the fear in the long term is that we will have you know, many Israeli companies who, as I said, took years to build and, and get to this point, have them being sold in, um, you know, very 
in, in, in much lower valuations than expected and not uh, you live up to the potential they had. So how uh, the companies see the situation and how did we communicate with uh, the government? First of all, uh, we needed clarity. And, and the fact that we didn't know what the government uh, plan is gonna look like was a big concern to us because a CFO needs to plan ahead, needs to see how the next 18 months are gonna look like. And, and if they have the, the tools to do so, uh, like in, 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 in two cases, for in, in, in like one end, they can say, I'm on my own, the government is not uh, gonna uh, put any specific you know, plans for the tech sector. I have to plan as if this is the only uh, uh, cash I'm gonna have in the, in the next 18 months. And, and from the other end, the, the government is going to prevail and I need to uh, plan the next three months until this plan is going to take place. We didn't know neither. So uh, this uncertainty uh, made companies uh, start to take action and fire uh, employees, which was, I think, uh, uh, something we could have prevented. Um, and and we talked about short term um, having the policy uh, be more focused on the on the credit crisis and help uh, companies get venture lending and and other loans like uh, like uh, um, uh, government backed loans uh, to address this specific crisis uh, and in the long term having a very good and aggressive uh, recovery plan in order to have the companies uh, uh, grow rapidly into the same place they were before the crisis. And in the meantime, uh, when planning the, the, the new normal you know, policies, uh, address specific issues that tech companies have and other sectors might not have that will help those companies uh, adjust better. So this is uh, what we did. We've worked with the Israeli Ministry of, of Finance, which I have to say uh, was a pleasure to work with. Uh, we worked with them on defining terms for government-backed uh, loans for the tech sector and also other sectors, but they did take uh, the tech sector into consideration and built their own path inside this uh, plan. Um, we've built a plan of communication with our industry, which means that once in every around 10 days, there is a government official that is going on a Zoom call like this one with the entire sector and explains where things stand, what is gonna happen, uh, what are the terms of, of the new uh, 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 loans uh, program, et cetera. This is something that creates, that, that you know, removes the psychological barriers for the decision makers and help them trust uh, 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 the government, which is something that is really important in, the, in this kind of situation. The third thing is working on a problem to find barriers uh, of regulation. I can give you some examples, very, you know, very Israeli ones, but uh, for instance, in Israel, uh, um, companies cannot work on Saturday. That's uh, not legal. Um, and, and many companies are, are now experiencing problems with their uh, support sites around the globe. Some of them were shut down and some of them cannot work from home. Uh, and this is a great opportunity for the Israeli economy. We can uh, hire new people in, in, in good you know, salaries in a time where we have 25 of our, uh, uh, you know, employment uh, uh, home. Uh, but we need to, to change this regulation. This is something uh, we're working on. Uh, and the third thing is starting to work on the recovery program, having one specific for the tech sector, uh, working on a very aggressive uh, M&A policy for Israeli companies, uh, meaning that Israeli companies will be able to acquire foreign companies and maybe be incentivized to do so. Uh, last point, please. 
Yes, and passion. no, and I, I think I'm 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 mainly done. That's it. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Karen. Uh, can you please uh, take down your uh, slides, please? Mm -hmm. And um, now it's time for uh, the Q and A. We have uh, two questions. One is related, and one is not related. Uh, but maybe first, I want to ask Amir and Christine, who co-host this session. Do you have any questions? I have a question. Okay. Well, two related questions. Um, which Georg or, or anyone could, could answer. Georg, on your presentation um, specifically, so the kind of explanation of why equity um, is preferable to debt, there are obviously supply side and demand side factors on that slide. On the supply side, you could presumably affect those incentives by encouraging banks through state underwriting um, to lend. So it seems to me then it will come really down to the demand side factors. And I can see the points that you make about why um, equity would be um, more attractive um, to give up than debt because of debt's disciplinary function and, and default risk. But I do wonder whether you're maybe slightly um, underestimating the potential value debt could bring at this time. Um, given that if it's emergency finance, founders may well not want to give up control rights in perpetuity and would rather take a risk, um, take a default risk than give up control rights. And then my second question, um, which is related to that, but more general is, can we learn anything from the past about how governments have responded to corporate crises in relation to, um, to startups? I just don't know the history, um, but thinking back beyond the most recent financial crisis into crises that were corporate in the, in their foundation. Can we learn anything from that in Germany or, or elsewhere? Those are my questions. Thank you. Okay, Christian, thanks so much. Um, yes, you're right. I mean, the, the downsides with uh, equity positions too. Uh, what they frequently do in Germany is then so-called silent positive participations where they take out equity positions, but uh, it's a sort of hybrid thing. They don't really exercise any voting um, positions or anything like that. So that would try to combine the best of both worlds in a way. Uh, and not to overburden the recipient startup with a high debt burden. That's, I think, the main imperative at the moment. Um, uh, and of course, it's not done directly by the government, but indirectly through sort of public uh, VC funds or funds of funds that indirectly support uh, ec private equity or venture capital funds. And um, the second question uh, was about uh, what we can learn from, I, I don't think there is a big lesson to be quite honest, because there hasn't been uh, the same problem in the startup scene. You know, the only thing that comes to mind is maybe the dot-com bubble from about 20 years ago, but that was very different uh, in its design. And, and, and the, you know, the, the 2008 crisis didn't really affect startups. And in, in fact, Germany is really learning about this because the, you know, the big the rise of the startup scene in particular in Berlin has really happened over the last several years. So we don't really have any big learning experience in that respect. There may be something we can help with uh, in terms yes. of Israeli experience. Yes. Please do. Um, actually, in 2008, uh, we, didn't, we didn't have much uh, of an impact because Israel didn't have a financial crisis, but we were affected uh, by the... Um, by the overall slowdown, and there was some slowdown because uh, because of that, the government basically didn't do anything. It did something small, very very late, which had no impact. So it we basically let the the industries, you know, go through it on on its own, and it went relatively relatively well. On the other hand, in 2002 2003, we had our own crisis, which was homemade following the dot-com crisis because Israeli industry was very developed at that stage already. And, uh, but, the, but the crisis was local and it was, um, you know, the GDP, the Israeli GDP went down by, um, I believe we lost about seven, eight percent of GDP over two years. So this was quite significant. Um, 
and the government basically ignored the ecosystem and it was at real danger of basically collapsing. Uh, but what happened is uh, the, the reason that, uh, that we survived is that um, American, mostly American uh, tech companies due to US tax regulation uh, kept a lot of their profits outside of the US, didn't want to repatriate them. And so they basically saw a great opportunity to swoop and buy a whole bunch of Israeli companies. And so that's what they did. And so that uh, ultimately changed the course of Israeli um, tech ecosystem from being focused on IPOs to being focused on M&As. And so that, that actually completely changed the, 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 even the nature how we how people are building companies uh, much much more for corporate exit than for than for a standalone company which has quite actually in some cases uh, unfortunate implication for Israeli economy because the majority of value actually accrues to somebody else so there is there you know I I don't think it's a good idea for the government to basically say well you guys are gonna figure it out. It can it can have very very strong long term implications. Okay, we have. I can add uh, from Asaf. I don't know if you want to continue. I can add some from the U.S. Very, perspective. Very very quickly, and then we have two questions. Okay. Yeah, I think I think uh, uh, two things here. One is uh, you, in, in this environment in the United States, no one wants to raise equity because valuations are so uncertain and pricing is so uncertain. Uh, and the loan programs have given those who need to bridge at least for three months while certainty develops uh, the time to sort of look at that. I think we have a larger market. So uh, Karim had mentioned Mellanox, like the Israeli market. I mean, Mellanox is being held up by the Chinese government for over a year, you know, and it's coming to the time to get approval. One big transaction like that could change everything. In the United States, we don't, we don't really have that. I think the, the second thing just very quickly is, uh, this is, um, people are dusting off their down round books from the dot-com crisis. Uh, venture capital arrangements usually have very complex rights of what happens when you raise at a lower valuation. And so uh, we're, we're struggling through that because we don't know if we're going to need that or not in the next three to six months. Stephen, thank you. We have uh, one question about Japan and one about uh, Africa. Uh, so I'll ask uh, Zenichi Shishido from Japan to ask the next question. Zenichi, please. Thank you. Hello? Can you yes, hear me? Yes, we hear you. Hello. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think that the, uh, uh, to provide the government money wisely to the startups is a very difficult uh, problem, even under the ordinary circumstances. And the, uh, uh, many years ago, Ron Gilson uh, wrote a paper uh, comparing the, uh, the Israeli Yozumar and uh, uh, German, uh, I forgot the name, but the uh, uh, program of the government money to uh, stimulate the startups. And the, uh, 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 so the uh, Japan shares the same problem with the Germany uh, uh, Japanese uh, government, uh, you know, uh, tend to uh, pick up the uh, start startups by themselves by bureaucrat, and the uh, are reluctant to introduce the uh, equity incentive, and the uh, uh, so the uh, rule of thumb to uh, use the taxpayer money wisely to the startups uh, is looks like the uh, government uh, just uh, provide risk money and uh, uh, don't let the bureaucrat choose that uh, portfolio company and give the uh, professional venture capitalist uh, enough equity incentive. So the, my question is, uh, now is we are uh, under the very, uh, uh, you know, urgent crisis time. So the, uh, uh, the way of uh, giving money to the startups should be different from, the, from such a rule of thumb under the uh, ordinary time, uh, or we should change the way of providing government money to the startups? That's my question. Thank you. Eugene, please. 
Yeah, I think in general, I absolutely agree with you. Um, unless the government, uh, there are actually uh, two government pro pro programs that are being uh, studied in Israel. One of them is Yuzma, which jump started the VC industry, which was basically bring us talent and will downside protect you for a while and give you kicker to the upside. Uh, that program basically didn't cost anything in terms of the outlays because all the money was returned within three to four years with interest. And uh, then it jump started very significant industry in Israel. Uh, the second thing is that Israeli government supports uh, just the Horizon program in the, in the European Union, supports cutting edge research which is a different program. It doesn't invest in, uh, in um, equity. It basically gives grants to promote uh, uh, research and um, development spillovers at the industrial stage. And so the, these two programs are complementary. The interesting thing is in this crisis, something very, um, uh, something very unique happens that is unique both for this time and for the high-tech industry is that the government basically, when it co-invests with the, with the private sector, its rate of return can be one order, two orders of magnitude higher than the return of the private investor who is guiding the investment. And the reason being is that um, uh, this, uh, uh, if, if, if these companies fail, and the people, not because they are not good, but because they have a liquidity crunch, uh, the people who are, um, who are going to be laid off are going to stop paying taxes, and uh, they're going to go on unemployment. So they, if the government takes into account the net investment and the fact that in this industry there is somebody who is willing to put fresh money they don't need to put into that company, therefore adverse selection is not such a problem, you get incredible rates of return that allow the government now to actually support the downside protection for, for various institutional investors and not to do it on its own, so not to use budget money. Okay, thank you very much, Eugene. We still have one question about Africa in the Q&A. Maybe, Eugene, you can answer it using the private answer function because I couldn't find the person on the ATD list. Uh, before we clear the stage for our next panel, I just want to say uh, at least two of my uh, takeaways from this panel. You know, one question is how, you know, who needs government money and do startups need government money at this time? The second question is how do you do a, a government assistant or bailout program with uh, as minimal cost as possible? I think one way to look at startups is that you already have an existing infrastructure of people who give who make equity investment and you can find some ways like in germany and hopefully in israel where the government could uh, piggyback those that infrastructure and make a smart equity investment and thereby reduce the cost and the second the second takeaway i think is that there are differences between countries. If you are a country that tries to build its tech sector, maybe one thing you need to be worried about is the large US corporations that uh, Stephen Davidoff mentioned that sit on a large piles of cash, have no liquidity, and are looking for bargains to buy uh, uh, you know, companies outside their jurisdiction and turn them into small R&D centers. Uh, with these thoughts, I really want to thank everyone, all the participants, uh, all those who were online listening. And now we move on perhaps to the less optimistic part of this session, uh, the one about director duties in times, director duties of times of crisis. Thank you very much. Amir and Christine, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Asaf. Thank you, Asaf. Um... It's, it's a pleasure. Uh, let me first welcome all the panelists and attendees that uh, are with us and uh, just joined us. Um, I would like to thank Elaine and Vanessa for pulling this off and also Luca for initiating, participating in the initiation of this, this wonderful event. Um, I'll give 
a few words of presentation and then I'll hand over uh, the Zoom, if you will, uh, to the panelists. Uh, Asaf and Kristin uh, will, will follow with some uh, comments and then uh, the floor, uh, virtually speaking, will be open for uh, Q&A. Uh, Asaf and I will collect them. Um, so I think that the topic that we have uh, for our session doesn't really call for a motivation statement, but, but I'll make a short one nonetheless. Uh, you know, directed duties and liabilities are always interesting. There's always, it's always a, a hot topic. Uh, and, but what we are seeing now, um, at least as, as far as I understand or know, is unprecedented. Uh, I, I can't recall any, uh, any situation in which it was proposed to kind of suspend the law uh, dealing with, uh, with the responsibility of the people who are responsible for doing things uh, just because the times are hard. But this is exactly what we're seeing uh, in several countries now. Australia has taken the lead, the UK and New Zealand are contemplating following. Uh, yesterday evening I learned that Ireland uh, is also thinking about or considering something similar. Um, I can tell you that in Israel uh, a debate is developing along similar lines pretty much in light of what is going on in, in the countries that I've, that I've mentioned. And, um, and the question is, uh, what's the point? Uh, the question, the, 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 what is the motivation that underlies these uh, initiatives? Uh, because at least, at least the way I see it, um, it these initiatives or proposals in, in, in Australia, there's all, already uh, legislation uh, in force about this uh, suspension, is that there's something very flawed in at least one particular type of director liability, uh, what's called wrongful trading or insolvent trading or reckless trading, uh, that, that if, if you will, uh, or if I may use this, this term, this, this kind of liability arguably causes managers some performance anxiety. Uh, just when they struggle to save their companies, then you know, the, the law imposes on, on them some, some weird liability that is, you know, by implication, might not be justified. And the question for the panelists, I think, is there something deeply flawed in this kind of liability? What are the motivations? What's the thinking uh, behind the, the, the proposal to suspend it? And um, if, if these uh, views are convincing, should we consider, you know, expanding the, this, this mode of suspension? And why, uh, if at all, should we do it uh, in this particular crisis of the, of the coronavirus? Um, so that's my little bit of, of motivation. Uh, we have three speakers. The first one is uh, Professor Ian Rumsey from uh, Melbourne Law School. Ian has been working on this topic for more than 20 years now, I believe. Uh, so he, he's the prime source uh, about the topic. Uh, Roberto Bonsignore will follow. He's a partner at uh, Cleary Gottlieb based in Milan. Uh, Roberto has extensive uh, practice in, uh, in the positive side of M&A transactions, but also on, in, in restructuring and insolvency. And uh, the third speaker is Robin Dicker uh, from South Square. He's a barrister at Queen's Council uh, with, again, extensive uh, uh, experience in massive litigations, uh, including also on, on insolvencies. So we'll have different perspectives in terms of academia and practice and different perspectives in terms of geography. Uh, Ian, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Amir. I, I'm very pleased to participate in this discussion and congratulations to ECGI for uh, uh, hosting this debate. Well, I've been asked to speak for about 10 minutes on the duty imposed on Australian directors to prevent insolvent trading. It would be true to say that Australia has one of the strictest regimes for insolvent trading in the world. The duty has existed in our legislation since 1961, but has been amended over the years. And those reforms, those amendments reflect the controversial nature of the duty. Uh, the law provides that a company director may be liable to pay compensation if, first, a company of which the person is a director incurs a debt 
And that debt can be wholly or partly unsecured when it's insolvent or the company becomes insolvent by incurring that debt. Secondly, there's reasonable grounds for suspecting that the company is insolvent or would become insolvent. And third, and finally, the director is aware when the debt's incurred that there's reasonable grounds for so suspecting or, and there's an objective standard, a reasonable person in a similar position would in fact be so aware. Uh, Recognising that it's a, a strict regime, there are defences that apply. Uh, they include the director having reasonable grounds to expect solvency, the director placing reasonable reliance on information uh, of solvency provided by a person who's competent and reliable, the director being absent from management when the relevant debts are incurred for good reason, and finally, the director taking reasonable steps to prevent the company incurring the debt. Now, one reason why the duty is controversial and why it has been subject to reform over the years is because of the penalties and remedies that attach to a breach. The insolvent trading regime allows a liquidator or indeed in limited circumstances, an individual creditor to apply for compensation for loss or damage due to the company incurring a, a debt. <clears throat> Now, any compensation paid by the director is for the benefit of unsecured creditors in the first instance, and the company must be in the course of being wound up. Now, interestingly and importantly, the Australian Securities and Investments Commission, our corporate regulator in Australia, has an enforcement role in relation to insolvent trading. And Australia is unusual among many countries in that it allows the corporate regulator to enforce director's duties in addition to private claims for breaches of director's duties. The Australian Securities and Investments Commission can apply for a court order that a director pay a monetary penalty if there's a breach of the insolvent trading duty of up to approximately $1 million. In addition, the regulator may seek a court order that the director be disqualified from managing companies for a period that the court determines is appropriate. And further, uh, the commission may take criminal action against a director where the failure to prevent the company incurring the debt was dishonest, dishonest and potential penalties that apply for a criminal breach of the duty to prevent insolvent can include a term of imprisonment or a fine. Now, ever since this duty existed in our corporate legislation, as I mentioned, it's been controversial. There's been long-standing policy debates regarding the duty to prevent insolvent trading. The duty has strong supporters, but it also has strong opponents. Those who support this duty argue that it forces directors to consider the interests of creditors, particularly at a time when insolvency is a vital issue. They also argue that it can promote business confidence in the sense that it's reasonable to expect that creditors are dealing with solvent companies and the duty is a disincentive to directors who would otherwise continue to operate an insolvent company. Supporters of the duty also argue that if an insolvent trading action is successful, it'll increase the pool of assets for distribution to unsecured creditors. But those who oppose the duty argue that it makes directors too risk averse with the result that directors may too readily put the company into liquidation or administration. In other words, that it prevents good faith company restructurings, even where it might be possible for the company to trade out of its financial difficulties. Uh, those opponents also argue that the duty can deter people from becoming directors and that it can deter people from becoming directors at precisely the time when you want some very talented directors with insolvency experience and expertise to be assisting companies in financial difficulties. Uh, I've undertaken two studies of insolvent trading court judgments over a number of years. These studies examined all the available judgments at the time of the study. The first study reviewed 100 and 103 court judgments from the 1970s. I mentioned the duty uh, existed from 1961, but there were no uh, judgments that I could find in the 1960s. So uh, judgments from the 1970s to 2004. The second study, which I undertook with a colleague, Stacey Steele, studied 39 judgments uh, uh, alleging breaches of the duty to prevent insolvent trading from 2004 to 2017. Now, one reason why uh, 
people focus on this duty is that the research indicates a very high success rate for plaintiffs. Directors were found liable in 72% of the judgments in the most recent study that I undertook. Uh, the average compensation awarded in the most recent study was about 850,000 Australian dollars, but the median was much less at about $410,000. Almost 60% of the compensation orders made against directors were for less than half a million dollars, but about one third of the judgments in which the duty was found to have been breached by a director involved compensation orders of over a million dollars. I mentioned earlier that there are four defences, but in the second study that I undertook, there was no judgment in which a director had successfully argued one of the statutory defences, although it was quite common for directors to make an argument that they had a defence. Now, because this duty has been so controversial, I suggest that it, out of all of the duties in our corporations legislation, it is the one that has generated most discussion and debate. It has been wound back over time, uh, most recently, of course, in response to COVID-19. Um, but it was first wound back uh, because the duty used to apply to all those involved in the management of the company. Now it applies only to directors of uh, companies, but those directors could include shadow or de facto directors. But secondly, it was only in late 2017 that the Australian government introduced a safe harbour for company restructures. Uh, there's now increased discussion of this safe harbour for company restructures, given the financial pressures placed on companies as a result of COVID-19. Now, to be eligible for that 2017 safe harbour, a director needs to show that first, uh, after they start to suspect that the company may be insolvent, uh, the director starts developing a course of action that's reasonably likely to, a to lead to a better outcome for the company. And secondly, the debt that the, or the debts that the, the company is incurring must be uh, incurred in connection with that course of action. And a better outcome is defined as an outcome that's better for the company than the immediate appointment of an administrator or liquidator to the company. So why did the government introduce that reform in late 2017? Well, if we look at the explanatory memorandum accompanying the amending act, uh, the government stated that the insolvent trading laws put too much emphasis on stigmatizing and penalizing failure. And the explanatory memorandum stated that the form will will drive cultural change amongst company directors and encourage directors to keep control of their company, engage early with possible insolvency and take reasonable risks to facilitate the company's recovery instead of simply putting the company prematurely into liquidation or voluntary administration. But has that reform been effective? And this is might, might partly give an answer to the most recent COVID-19 reform. Well, Stacey Steele and I conducted a survey of insolvency practitioners just late 2019 about the safe harbour reform. And the survey resulted in some key findings. First, the insolvency practitioners, the very people who would we expect to be at the cutting edge of the safe harbour reform, generally had limited experience with it. But secondly, one of the key objectives was to obtain the views on whether the safe harbour reform had achieved the government's objectives. And the government stated, as, as I mentioned a moment ago, that the reform was aimed at facilitating more successful company restructures and promoting entrepreneurship. Well, when we asked respondents, uh, their answer was in the negative. 48% of the respondents either disagreed or strongly disagreed with the statement that the reform is achieving more successful company restructures. Only 17% agreed or strongly agreed with the statement. 59% um, of respondents either disagreed or strongly disagreed with the statement that the reform promotes entrepreneurship by business people. And only 6% agreed or strongly agreed with the statement. So in summary, those responding to the survey indicated they didn't have much experience with it. In other words, it didn't appear to be uh, being used much and they didn't think the reform was achieving the objectives set forth by the government. But in the past month or so, there's been much more discussion of companies using the safe harbour. Now, when we finally turn to the, the COVID-19 safe harbour, 
this change passed by the Australian Parliament as one of a series of reforms responding to COVID-19 goes well beyond the 2017 safe harbour reform for corporate restructures. The change provides that insolvent trading liability does not, does not apply if the debt's incurred in the ordinary course of the company's business and during a six month period that starts 25 March 2020. Why did the government uh, do this reform and do it very urgently and do it with minimal, if any, consultation? Well, the Department of Treasury states that directors' personal liability can lead to directors being under pressure to make quick decisions to enter into liquidation or voluntary administration. Companies need to have the confidence to continue to trade throughout the current crisis, says Treasury. Now, I'll make a couple of concluding comments. It's important to note that the COVID-19 change to insolvent trading still allows for potential criminal liability where the director's failure to prevent the company was dishonest. But in addition, other duties imposed on company directors continue to apply with full force and effect, including duties to take reasonable care, to act in the best interest of the company, to avoid conflicts of interest, and to not make improper use of position as a director. But the recent reform does indicate the government's view that the duty to prevent insolvent trading is not well suited to the COVID-19 environment. The government has, of course, suspended civil liability under the duty for six months. And as we can appreciate, the insolvent trading laws in Australia and similar laws in other countries where the wrongful trading, reckless trading, they reflect a balance between protecting creditors and allowing directors the freedom to continue to trade, even through financially challenging circumstances. With the COVID-19 reform, the government has clearly shifted the balance away from creditor protection. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ian. Thank you very much. Uh, Roberto, are you there? Can yes, you have here. Can you hear me, uh, Amir? Yep, you're on. Okay, thank you. Um, so what I'll try to do here is to give a brief overview of how legislation has responded to the crisis uh, in a, a number of jurisdictions across Europe, namely Italy, Germany, and France. Um, I think it's, it's, uh, what comes out of this comparison is that uh, all, all jurisdictions have um, addressed, uh, well, legislators in all, all of these jurisdictions had clearly mind the three main aspects of how you need to deal with the crisis here. Not, not all of them have responded in the same way and not all of them are responded at all in certain cases, but I think the three areas are pretty clear in all three jurisdictions. And if you think about it uh, as a business walking into this crisis, you will have mainly three things in mind. The first thing is that you need to keep your business open. Um, and in that regard, all jurisdictions will of course have um, uh, bankruptcy or insolvency proceedings uh, filing requirements that would prevent you from keeping your business open in a situation like this, uh, unless you are relatively unaffected by the crisis. So the first area is really um, keeping the business open. And, and there are responses to that. And I think it's pretty uniform uh, around, across, across these three jurisdictions with minor differences. The second area is that once you have, um, you, you kept your business open, you need to run it. And that's where directors, liabilities, uh, and wrongful trading comes in, because you have to uh, deal with a number of rules uh, that, uh, in in the sort of twilight zone, make it difficult, or insolvency zone, make it difficult for you to run your business. So the second area of response is how you could run your business in that environment given the crisis, and we have different again responses in that regard, or no responses at all in some cases. The third area, once you keep your business open, you can run it, is really funding it. Again, uh, besides the various tools that uh, governments have uh, introduced to uh, ensure that there's enough liquidity around, from a strictly legal point of view, in many jurisdictions, you have uh, risks associated with um, taking on new loans or giving out collateral uh in a in a situation of crisis um including for creditors 
which may keep creditors away and make it more difficult for you to get funding in, in a situation like this. So this is the third area, keeping the business open, running it in the ordinary course and, and funding it. So starting from the first area, all three jurisdictions, of course, have filing requirements, as I said, and all of them have suspended, suspended uh, this uh, requirement. Not only the requirement for uh, debtors themselves to file for one form or another of insolvency proceedings, but also uh, a ban for creditors from uh, filing uh, a request for uh, insolvency proceedings against the uh, company. Um, which is understandable. It gives uh, a number of months. Sometimes it's uh, for Italy is until the end of January, for Germany is until the end of uh, September, for France, I think it's the end of August, but everybody I think has come to the conclusion that you need at least a few months of truce in one sense, and that people do, do not need to worry about running to court. Um, two things here. One is that, um, a debtor is not required to file, but of course may file if they decide to do so, uh, with different variations across jurisdictions, but uh, you have all, you know, various types of proceedings at this stage. Uh, you know, recently, uh, in recent years, all jurisdictions have introduced all uh, various forms of, of court supervised, court administered uh, restructuring uh, proceedings uh, shaped in one way or another after um, the chapter, the U.S. Chapter 11 uh, model, uh, and those are of course available, and, and plus other types of, of proceedings. So you don't need to file, but if you want file, of course you can. Uh, and we will see that there may be a perverse incentive in one sense to do so, at least in Italy, for the reasons that I will explain in a second. The second comment is that, um, which is very interesting, I think, is that yes, you don't need to file, and your credit you're protected against your creditors. They don't, they cannot attack you uh, with a request for bankruptcy. At the same time, nobody has stopped uh, your ordinary individual enforcement actions. So, if you wish, bankruptcy proceedings are nothing but a collective enforcement action, which is uh, suspended for now. But individual enforcement actions are still there. Now, one wonders how, what is the interplay now is going to be between those two different levels and perhaps bring us, brings us back to a, an era where uh, people had individual enforcement actions against debtors, but there was no bankruptcy protection. Uh, so one wonders uh, what kind of world we are stepping into is, is going to be a far west. Are we going to be back centuries when there was no uh, par conditio creditorum principle and everybody, you know, the assets went to the quickest creditor and how the system will react to that. Now, in practice, this may be interesting theoretically, but in practice may in fact be uh, irrelevant because the suspension is short. As a matter of practice, in Italy, for instance, it's unlikely that within such a short period, uh, even if you go for individual enforcement, you can actually get your hands on proceeds at the end of the day. Um, I think in France, you do have a court equity, equitable um, uh, power to uh, suspend enforcement for uh, uh, up to two months, I think, uh, or more. So uh, I think the system will cope and practically speaking, we won't see uh, the clash that I uh, highlighted before. But it, it will, if this goes on for a longer period of time, it would be interesting to see how one level interacts with the other. So that's the first point, uh, keeping their business open. The second one is running it in the ordinary course. Um, so running a business in the ordinary course, of course, uh, is complicated in normal circumstances. Uh, when you're nearing insolvency or you're outright insolvency, all the jurisdictions have restrictions against payments and uh, 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 rules on challenging transactions entered into a period prior to bankruptcy. Uh, or avoiding those transactions somehow, uh, which make it more difficult and risky uh, to run your business. But in this particular emergency, you do need to run it uh, and everybody is in a crisis and therefore uh, you, these jurisdictions have tried to give a response. Um, so uh, I think Germany has, has taken it uh, 
pretty uh, methodology, you know, pretty uh, has a pretty complete uh, response. Um, so normal payment restrictions that would expose directors um, to liability uh, in, in in these cases have been have been uh, modified to make it much uh, safer for managers to run their business and make payments. Basically, the normal principle is that you cannot make payments in this uh, in this phase unless uh, a prudent and diligent manager would make that payment. Now, what the Germans did is interesting because they simply said, well, in this particular time, uh, run, uh, making payments to uh, run your business in the ordinary course and to continue operations or implement a restructuring is by operational law deemed to be prudent and diligent. So that's quite, uh, uh, that's quite uh, good. Um, uh, I guess it's, uh, it would take out a lot of the stress that Amir was mentioning earlier in, in, in making payments during, during this difficult time. Now, France uh, didn't do uh, anything like that, but I think you, um, uh, well, first of all, uh, there are rules on making payments uh, in the ordinary course um, uh, in, this, in these circumstances are far less uh, worrying for for managers so if, if you make ordinary payments up until the day before the filing um, uh, uh, that's that's still good of course avoidance uh, of transactions <coughs> is is still an issue as it is an issue in germany <coughs> um, and in italy again germany on challenging transaction has been uh, has put out a, a response which is uh, quite helpful. Um, basically, transactions can be challenged under normal rules, but only if uh, the counterparty um, knows, is aware that there are no prospects of recovery for uh, the debtor. Uh, but quite helpfully uh, goes on to specify that the, the, counter, the counterparty has no duty to investigate those prospects. So again, uh, practically speaking, uh, when you're dealing with a debtor in the ordinary course, it's obvious that you cannot, uh, you do not need to worry uh, too much. You don't need to diligence your counterparty, whether they're gonna make it or not, whether they have prospects to recover or not. Uh, you can deal with them without a significant risk of uh, avoidance of your transaction. Uh, unless, of course, for some reason you're aware that the company is really bust and there's no reason, no, no hope to, to uh, recovering the business. Uh, in, in France, similarly, uh, um, although there's no explicit rule, because of the way the rules work, um, practically speaking, it's going to be uh, uh, very difficult to bring an avoidance action on transactions that are entered into uh, during the suspension period. So you get to a... Yes. Uh, could you try to kind of wrap up? Yeah. In a... I'm going to wrap it up very quickly. Uh, yeah, just you. to mention that in France, you have similar practical uh, situation. Unfortunately, Italy is not the same because uh, the issue was discussed in the commission that dealt with these changes and um, uh, we, nothing was, was done in that respect. So um, liabilities of directors uh, for making payments during this period, rules on avoidance of transactions they have not been changed at all not even for ordinary course uh, payments and transactions which uh, create a, a bit of a uh, of a weird limbo uh, where yes on the one hand you're not required to uh, file um, but at the same time you run significant risk uh, running your business and doing transactions so as a manager, you're put really in a, in a very difficult spot given the circumstances and, and per, perhaps even, beca even because uh, the, the, the requirement to file has been suspended. So that's why I'm saying there could be a perverse incentive, in fact, for Italian managers to just go into some form of restructuring procedure, perhaps not even having a clear plan, but just to protect yourself and your, your board because again, you can, you can run your business, but you're exposed to risk in a situation which is far more difficult than, than normal circumstances. Just one very last statement on funding, at least on funding, uh, Italy is making it, more, make it easier for shareholders to fund their businesses. There's, we normally have rules on equitable subordination of shareholders loan, which are suspended. Uh, same in Germany. Germany went a step further and said that 
Uh, if you take a loan in this period, repayments up until 2023 are not going to be challenged and collateral is not going to be challenged. Um, and most importantly, creditors will not be exposed to liability for fraudulent delay of insolvency or cooperating in a delay of insolvency because um, in this period, uh, uh, of course, loans extended by lenders uh, are helpful and people want to, of course, not expose uh, creditors to lenders to uh, increase liability in this period. So they're lowering it actually. Um, the bar, they're high, actually uh, increasing uh, the bar there, and uh, so lenders are protected in this particular case. So that's that's a good response that unfortunately we don't find in Italy, we don't find in France. So theoretically uh, and practically speaking, lenders are still exposed to significant risk in those countries, unlike Germany. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roberto. Uh, let's move directly to Robin Dicker. Robin, are you there? Robin? Uh, yes, I'm here. On. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Amir has asked me to spend a few minutes just summarizing uh, recent intended changes to insolvency law in the UK. Um, at the end of the March, the UK government announced a package of intended reforms to insolvency law. Um, in large part to deal with the current COVID crisis. The detail is still limited. We're going to have to wait until Parliament reconvenes next week to, to find out more. But there appear to be three main elements, and I just want to outline those. Um, the first is new. Um, what's proposed is a temporary suspension of wrongful trading provisions for company directors. Uh, at the moment, under the Insolvency Act, a director may be personally liable to pay compensation if three things are established. Firstly, the company has gone into insolvent liquidation or administration. Secondly, uh, he must have known there was no reasonable prospect of avoiding that. And thirdly, after he knew that, he must have failed to take uh, every step to minimize loss to creditors. Um, the proposal appears to be that there will be a three-month suspension of uh, that provision, which will operate retrospectively from the 1st of March uh, of this year. And the obvious intention is to try and remove the incentive that would otherwise exist for directors to put companies into some form of insolvency proceedings. Um, there's a debate about how significant this proposal is. Um, I uh, am aware of little hard empirical evidence suggesting that directors are in fact um, encouraged, motivated, incentivized to put companies into uh, insolvency proceedings by the, the risk of um, wrongful trading liability as opposed to any other possible source of liability. Um, there are not in fact that many wrongful trading claims uh, in the UK uh, and fewer still that are successful. It may be that we differ slightly from the Australian experience in that respect. Uh, I think that's largely because uh, English judges tend to uh, give a lot of store to business judgments made by uh, company directors. Um, and the third, perhaps most important point is directors will still be liable for breach of the existing fiduciary duties and the um, other statutory provision for fraudulent trading is not going to be suspended. So I, I, um, it certainly um, won't harm, but I, as I said, I think there is an issue about how significant this proposal is. Um, the other two proposals are um, not entirely new. They appear to originate from consultation which the government carried out uh, in 2018 uh, and some proposals for insolvency um, reforms. Um, the first is uh, a proposal for an interim moratorium. Um, it looks likely that it'll be for up to 90 days granted to companies facing COVID-19 um, problems. Uh, it will be freestanding. In other words, it's not um, something which is only triggered by the commencement of some form of insolvency process. Not entirely clear, as I, uh, as I said, what 
um, this will involve. Um, but I think there are a, a few likely indicators from the 2018 consultation. Um, firstly, it's probably only going to be available to companies that are solvent, capable of being rescued, and which can pay their ongoing liability during the period of moratorium. Um, secondly, most interestingly, it may include provisions preventing suppliers from enforcing certain contractual termination provisions, so-called so facto clauses during the moratorium. Um, and there may also be an expenses regime as well. Um, third point, there may be a monitor appointed to oversee the, the process. Um, I think this is potentially the most significant proposal. Um, it's less onerous and less expensive than an administration order. We've been trying to um, go in this direction through the use of what we've been calling light touch uh, administrations, uh, essentially administrations, but with less um, involvement by um, uh, insolvency practitioners and office holders. Um, the third is a, a new restructuring plan, again trailed in 2018. Um, it's likely to be similar to existing schemes of arrangement in the UK. In other words, a process for compromising or arranging claims. Uh, creditors are required to vote um, by class uh, and a, a majority is required to um, approve the uh, arrangement and bring it into effect. There are um, a couple of differences from uh, existing schemes of arrangement. First, um, unusually, from an English perspective, uh, it may introduce the concept of cross-class cram-downs, uh, not dissimilar to, to the position in the US. So creditors vote in classes, but unlike the present position, if one class votes against the um, scheme, against the plan, the court can nevertheless approve it in certain circumstances. For someone who's spent the last 10 or 20 years um, trying to use uh, schemes and wrestling with, with class issues, that I think is, is a potentially very interesting development. Um, I think this is likely to be more significant in the longer term. The expectation here is that there will um, almost inevitably be a very large number of companies requiring um, to be uh, uh, restructured uh, after the present um, crisis subsides somewhat. And uh, I think these proposals, if implemented, are likely to make that, that um, easier and more flexible. As I say, in relation to all three, um, we don't have a lot of detail at the moment. Uh, we're likely to get more detail, it's thought, during the course of next week. Um, we will have to see uh, how much has progressed from there. Thank you, Robin. Is that it? That is it. Perfect. Wonderful. Uh, so let's move now to uh, Kristen. Would you like to respond first and, and then Asaf? Sure, sure, no problem, Amir. Um, sure. Thank you so much to the panelists for great presentations. Um, I have a, a comment, I suppose, rather that, than a question. Um, it seems to me there's at least two different stories we can tell about what's happening with director liability at the moment. There's a story about jurisdictions that generally are quite hard on directors and require a lot of directors when a company becomes insolvent. And the story that um, Roberto and, and Ian are telling seems to me a story about relaxing those restrictions in the current crisis. Um, and then as Roberto said, the key question becomes, is there joined up thinking? If you've relaxed one thing, do you need to relax other things um, where they're in intimately tied together if the objective is to avoid unnecessary opening of insolvency proceedings? Um, and then there's the UK, and I think the UK story is actually very different, and there are plenty of hints of this in, in Robin's presentation. So I don't think the UK regime is particularly hard on directors, at least if we put to one side the new compensation order regime introduced in the Company Directors Disqualification Act, which I think potentially is harsher than anything we had previously. But if we put that to one side, I think... Uh, the wrongful trading rule is a much more generous and relaxed rule than the rule that Ian described. Um, so we don't have a rule that exposes 
directors to personal liability merely because they authorise um, the company to incur a debt at a time when they're insolvent. As, as Robin explained, the rule, the trigger for the English rule is much later. It's at the, only at the point in time where insolvency proceedings are inevitable, that you're even within the penumbra of the regime. And then there's no per se liability merely for doing something like authorising the incurring of a debt. Um, rather, it's about your ability to demonstrate that whatever you do do or don't do is appropriate, whether you're taking the relevant steps to minimise potential loss to creditors. Um, so we are at the starting point for the UK, I think, is very different to both the Australian position, as explained by Ian, and to the position in the jurisdictions that Roberto described. And I think what's interesting then about the UK story is, is probably two things. One, what the government has announced in relation to wrongful trading, I think I completely agree with, with Robin. Um, this announcement of the suspension of the wrongful trading rule is in my view likely to do little in substance to reduce the scope of directors existing personal liability because other rules remain on foot. Um, but what the government is doing at the same time, as Robin has suggested, is to revive a proposal from 2018 to do something much more dramatic, which is to introduce a freestanding moratorium, restraints on um, the exercise of termination rights in executory contracts, and um, a restructuring tool that would enable a majority of classes to bind a dissenting class, um, which is something that's never been possible in the scheme of arrangement. So it seems to me the UK story is, it looks like we're doing something dramatic on director liability. In substance, I doubt we are. And at the same time, in connection with that, we're bringing in something um, which I think is much more dramatic and of general effect than the suspension of the wrongful trading rule. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kristen. Asaf? Uh, now, I'll, let's turn it to the Q&A, please. Okay, very well. Um, so we have a, a, we have a number of uh, questions from, from the audience. Um, I'll try to kind of general, kind of glean a general theme from what has been uh, asked. And at least maybe even all four of, uh, of these comments uh, raise the issue of stakeholders, uh, non, Non-financial creditors, stakeholders, I suppose, uh, would be fair to say. Uh, and, and the question is, or the kind of a, the thrust of, of the question is, is uh, should in this time of crisis, particularly in this time of crisis, should the duty of directors be expanded to include or to consider uh, an other stakeholders in addition to financial uh, stakeholders? Of course, I mean, this, this goes back to the kind of the fundamental, the core question of, of, you know, corporate law and corporate governance, the purpose of the corporation. And, um, and the fact that it's been raised now, I think, just indicates how fundamental the question is. Anyway, practically speaking, from your various or three different perspectives from your kind of a legal system, uh, your own legal system, is there room now, greater room, small room, uh, for considering stakeholder, non-financial stakeholders beyond uh, the general position of, of, of the law in your countries? Um, we'll start with Ian, I suppose. Ian? Thanks, Amir. Well, certainly it's been the case under Australian law that directors have had the freedom to consider a broad range of stakeholder interests. Uh, that was confirmed by two inquiries set up by the government uh, that published reports in 2006. Having said that, I think it's true to say that the Australian law of directors' duties is generally regarded as one that supports what we might call shareholder primacy. Uh, in other words, it starts to look something like the UK, but, but, but uh, different to Section 172 of the UK Companies Act because it doesn't uh, mandate a list of stakeholder interests to be considered. But this issue has, of course, and quite understandably, gotten increased traction in recent years. Indeed, we've had a debate in the last couple of years about the extent to which our duty of care 
uh, imposes an obligation on directors of companies to be considering climate change. Why this, I think, is interesting is that discussion of stakeholder interests most commonly uh, comes up when we consider the duty to act in the best interests of the company. But because the Australian duty of care is one that is actively litigated, uh, interestingly, by our corporate regulator uh, to a larger degree than private plaintiffs, people pay a lot of attention to it. And indeed, some of our prominent companies have, uh, uh, their directors have been the recipient of claims or prosecutions by the corporate regulator. So it's quite an important duty in Australia, whereas in other countries, it assumes less importance. So in that context, there has been some vigorous debate about the extent to which that duty imposes an obligation of companies or company directors to be considering issues associated with climate change, depending upon the degree to which that company is affected by climate change. Uh, in the current environment, uh, general discussion leads one to believe that uh, that, can, that can be accentuated to the extent to which directors are, of course, acutely concerned at the moment with the interests of employees and, of course, uh, creditors also. So would Australian courts give some effect to these, you know, increased sensitivities to other stakeholders? Because, I mean, due to the coronavirus crisis, specifically with regard to the COVID-19 situation, or just going, you know, falling back on the, you know, a century old debate that we all, we are all familiar with. So I think as a matter of law, it's hard to say that the law is changing as a result of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, it, by the law, I'm referring to the director's duties uh, uh, as, as developed by the courts. Uh, I think that while we're seeing directors publicly uh, uh, consider the interests of employees as they're interviewed regularly at the moment in, in, in vigorous debates on what their priorities are, I think courts themselves at the moment um, are, are likely, um, given uh, the effect of precedent, if you like, to largely adhere to established doctrine and they would look to Parliament for leadership on any change in the fundamentals of directors' duties, as indeed we've seen with uh, the duty to prevent insolvent trading and the suspension of civil liability for six months. Roberto? Uh, yes, I guess for Italy and across uh, continental Europe, the, the issue is that um, uh, a company's interest is not, is not, be, is not traditionally being seen as uh, the same thing as shareholders' interest. So um, uh, our case law and, and rules have always been, be, always been uh, revolving around the concept that you have a company's interest, which is separate from other stakeholders. Uh, um, but over time, of course, uh, <clears throat> you, you, of course, you do have rules on liabilities of directors <clears throat> to shareholders, to creditors and third parties that need to be taken into account. Uh, over time, I think we've somewhat shifted more in the sense of an Anglo-Saxon approach of giving uh, some uh, higher preeminence to shareholders, to shareholders' interests, but uh, we still remain a system that is fundamentally based on a concept of companies' interests as separate. Um, now, how how this uh, this uh, body of rules and principles uh, will adapt uh, in 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 the crisis? It's a very good question and and not uh, one that is easy to answer. To um, if I were to guess, I think obviously in a crisis there's a shift in uh, prominence uh, <clears throat> of a creditors' interest as opposed to shareholders' interest. Uh, clearly. Um, my guess is that given the nature of this crisis and the systemic effects that it has uh, uh, over the entire system, um, we're going to see courts uh, uh, perhaps giving more, um, giving more weight uh, in this situation to preserving continuity uh, and perhaps uh, the interest of the employees and of the continuity of the business as such. Uh, and, and a bit less so to the interest of creditors. But that is just my guess, because the issue is, um, will be how, how reasonable and how diligent is a manager today in, sacrifice or in, in taking actions that, yes, do put the interest of creditors uh, at more at risk, 
than normally would be the case. In the name of protecting business continuity in a, in a situation with it, which is absolutely exceptional. Um, and I think that that is where the issue is going to be. And I suspect that uh, courts will will give more weight in, in this situation to um, diligently and reasonably keeping your business running uh, in the reasonable expectation that your liquidity uh, uh, issues and creditors risk that you're running uh, are going to be resolved uh, in a matter of months, uh, which is normally not, not, not a standard uh, in, in these cases. So Robin, it's Robin's turn now. And, and the, the question I, I suppose is uh, in, would you predict that English courts, UK courts would somehow adjust the way they interpret or implement section 172 and the duty shifting rules to the COVID-19 situation? I, um, <laughs> our duties are obviously now, as you say, codified. Um, I suspect judges will not regard this as an opportunity to consciously reshape the law. What I think the crisis does do is expand the range of possible responses by directors. Uh, directors' duties is obviously a very fact-sensitive um, question, and I think unprecedented events can often justify different approaches. Uh, and I think the courts will be responsive to those sorts of issues. Um, I think this is a difficult area. I mean, we've been grappling for about the last 10 years with the concept that directors owe a duty uh, to the company, not merely to have regard to the interests of shareholders, but also in certain circumstances, um, creditors. And two issues we've been trying to get a clear view in relation to are, are one, where does that shift? When does that shift occur? What point do directors have to regard, have regard to the interests of creditors? Um, that's the timing point. Um, and the second is, what in practice does that mean? Um, do you have to treat um, creditors' interests as lexically prior, satisfied in full, before you can return to interests of shareholders? Or, or is there some sort of balancing exercise, or does it depend on the facts? Um, we've made little progress as a matter of analysis in resolving those issues. I think judges are conscious of that. Uh, and as I say, I suspect they won't um, deliberately use this opportunity to reshape the law. That said, it wouldn't surprise me if in 10 years and we look back at decided cases, someone can see a theme developing and um, restates the law um, in accordance with the, um, with the precedents that we can now see. But, but I think that's probably going to be the shape of things. So no, no idea of no, never waste a good crisis. Yeah. Amir, can I briefly add to that? Um, sure, yeah, thank you. I, I completely agree with Robin that courts, I think would be particularly slow English courts at this point in time to disturb settled understandings of judicially developed rules because of the um, already um, uncertain position that directors find themselves in. But I think it's also right to say that the suspension of the wrongful trading rule will, I think, inevitably lead to greater reliance on the West Mercia duty shifting rule that Robin has alluded to. And since many of the contours and, and the scope of that rule have not ever needed to be definitively settled because many forms of behaviour that could comfortably have been regulated by either rule have been easily answered by the wrongful trading rule, the suspension of that rule will push that behaviour back in to be regulated by the West Mercia rule. And so I agree with Robin that we may well find more cases on the duty shifting rule um, as a consequence of the suspension of the wrongful trading rule that may end up with a rule that we don't quite recognise today in, in 10 years time, as we're forced to settle some questions that haven't yet been settled on that, on that rule. So can, can I push you a little bit uh, on this particular point, because I mean, you have shown that many of the cases, perhaps most of the cases uh, that you know relied or invoked West Mercia, uh, were not purely duty shifting cases. I mean, they often involve other breaches of fiduciary duties, uh, you know, conventional breaches. Uh, 
but, but what you're saying now is that courts might kind of take advantage of forced mercia in an expanded way. And, and this actually connects with the point that I wanted to kind of wrap up with. Is usually we think about bankruptcy or du bankruptcy doctrines and duty shifting doctrines as something that is dedicated for uh, companies in times of, of crisis, but those are isolated crises, like idiosyncratic, non-systemic. Right now, what we have is systemic crisis where all companies are struggling, all, many companies, maybe most of the companies are already in the zone of insolvency. Is there, in, in your view, uh, Kristen, Robin, uh, Ian, Roberto, uh, a need in the time that we have, uh, is there a need to kind of expand our understanding of duty shifting or the zone of insolvency to, to cope with the fact that the economy is, is in this zone, not just particular uh, corporations? Kristen. Um, sure, so the first point, um what might we ask the West Mercia rule to do now? The point I was really making there was that to date, West Mercia is mostly being used to regulate a kind of behavior that isn't well regulated by the wrongful trading rule, which is essentially directors self-interestedly paying preferences with a view to extracting some personal gain in anticipation of a liquidation. That form of behavior can only really be regulated by the West Mercia rule or the new compensation regime in the Directive Disqualification Act because the wrongful trading rule is restricted to compensation caused for loss to the company. But if we take the wrongful trading rule away, then I think we can see that some of the behaviour that was regulated by the wrongful trading rule could also be regulated by the West Mercia rule. So we might, might find that rule being used in ways it hasn't had to be used so far. Now, your second question, um, should we revisit a duty shifting rule in a time like this? I think, I think that's the question. On the one hand, I can see the advantage of doing so would be there's a risk that a duty shifting rule of the kind that Robin described will make directors too risk averse at a time where they're already risk shy. Um, and we want them to be able to exploit new opportunities um, for, their, for their firms rather than um, not exploit those where they're expected to be value maximizing. On the other hand, we don't really know, as Robin said, how much as an empirical matter directors are influenced by any of these rules. But we do think, I, th I think at least, there's good reason to expect that lenders do know about the duty sh shifting rules. And so my own instinct is that the downside of um, trying to restrict the duty shifting rule at this time would be to send the wrong signal to lenders that their interests are not to be treated as paramount at exactly the time where we want lenders to support distressed debtors. So I can see the arguments either way, but on balance, my intuition is that we're better off retaining a duty shifting rule for the crisis, acknowledging that it may promote some or lead to some um, costly risk aversion. Ian, do you have a different view on this? No, Kristen, I would tend to uh, but support your view. Uh, I would also say that uh, I, I, I agree with you that I think we are likely to see more litigation under this particular duty, which in Australia is the duty to act in the best interests of the company, uh, where uh, uh, courts have told us since uh, 1976 in Australia that directors need to consider the interests of creditors as insolvency looms. A lot of unsettled questions about that particular obligation or that duty, and I think this is where we, we are likely to see courts and uh, explore, for example, what that actually means to say that you must consider the interests of creditors. What do directors actually have to practically do? Uh, now, of course, as, as we know, insolvent trading is suspended. This duty remains as live as ever. I, I apologize to the other panelists. We need to wrap up uh, in the interest of time. So thank you very much, uh, Ian, Roberto, Robin. Thank you for joining us, Asaf. Uh, thank you very much to all the speakers on both uh, sessions. Perhaps one way to tie together the discussion, I'm going back to one of the points made by Kerem earlier on. Certainty is really important. And the first session addressed efforts by the government to push money into many companies that are now technically insolvent. So maybe a judge made rules to be decided you know, three or five years, six years down the road is not the best way to think about how do you need to keep up 
and many companies that are uh, solvent, uh, insolvent on many measures right now. And with this, I would say happy note, but this complicated note. Thank you, everyone, and please join us uh, half an hour from now from the next session.